Welcome to Comic Tropes, I'm your host Chris. Public service announcement comics are something I'm an absolute sucker for. I've covered them on the channel before, and I'll continue to do so. I find that while their heart is often in the right place, the execution is sometimes tone deaf. I find that very amusing. Today, I want to go back in time to 1984, a simpler time when Americans were fiercely resistant to a simple thing that could make them safer. They argued that it infringed on their freedom and was needlessly inconvenient, uh, despite statistics showing us that doing this simple thing would save a lot of lives. I'm talking about seatbelts. Here's the cover to American Honda Presents DC Comics Supergirl in cooperation with the U.S. Department of Transportation's National Safety Belt Campaign. You sure you don't want to just call it something simple like Supergirl on seatbelt safety? No? Alright, well, how about if we added a few more caveats to the title, like teaching you the facts about seatbelts and how to keep yourself safe as of 1984 statistics from the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration. The cover is a little confusing. It clearly has Supergirl trying to get someone out of a vehicle. Water is pouring in, but it sort of looks like the driver is stuck in the seat because he has a strap across his chest. Stuck in the car, that would sort of be an argument against safety belts, but it's not like I have a better idea. It's not like you could show a body crumpled up on the hood with multiple compound fractures. That's not exactly on brand for Supergirl. The story itself begins with this splash page of Supergirl flying over what we're told is a recent earthquake. Trust me, that is her flying, although you could be forgiven for thinking that she's just falling. It's a very awkward pose, a surprised look on her face, and the lines of the highway in the distance look a little like motion lines pointing downwards. The artist is not someone known for doing a lot of superhero work. It's Angelo Torres, who mostly worked for Mad Magazine on movie and TV parodies. He's good at expressive faces and likenesses, but not necessarily known for dramatic poses and clear panel-to-panel -panel storytelling. However, I will give him credit for being pretty good at real-world details, which of course helps in a story that needs cars. Supergirl thinks to herself about how she's glad that she told her boyfriend Steve that she'd call him back instead of putting him on hold, since fixing all the earthquake damage will take a little while. It's not the most exciting dialogue, but most of this story is pretty weird, and that's likely because it took four people to write this, and one of the writers is also the editor. On top of that, there are two special consultants, an executive coordinator, and an advisor. That's a hell of a lot of people for writing one comic book story, and let me assure you, writing by committee does not help a comic book get better. The best analogy I can come up with is if you went to a barber shop and you had four people simultaneously cutting your hair and three of them were actually front desk help instead of stylists, you'd probably end up with a haircut that looks something like, well, something like this. Back to the story, and it is about to peak early, folks. A truck driver says, Gotta step on it. I can't let the quake shake up this rig. The driver speeds past crashed cars, only to realize his folly when he realizes he's about to drive right off the edge of a collapsed bridge. Folks, I gotta give this guy employee of the month. His reaction to complete devastation is to speed up and do his job even faster. With no time to hit the brakes, the truck driver gives us a running commentary on his imminent death. What the? Some kind of hot light! Bending the road straight up! And we can see that Supergirl is blasting the road with her heat vision, which has bent the road upwards and sent the truck hurtling through the air towards her. Now, I'm no physics expert, but I don't understand how heat applied to a road would make it bend upwards instead of maybe just melting. Shut up. Let's get this straight. Vin Diesel? I didn't expect you here. Are you? But then again, you are the expert on cars. Cars, bikes, boards, you name it. 
So, you're known for doing crazy things with cars. Are you saying that this is possible? That this checks out? Yeah. Dude, stop thinking Prague Police and start thinking PlayStation. Okay. Vin Diesel says that it checks out. Yeah, I can go with that. Supergirl's heat vision plan works, and she catches the truck in midair. We can see some of the truck's cargo fall out the back, and it's dynamite. This driver was ready to floor it while carrying dynamite. Is that devotion or stupidity? Regardless, Supergirl has time to catch the truck, lay it down, have the truck driver get out to greet her, and she still has time to look down the bridge in time to see the stick of dynamite explode when it reaches the ground. Because this took place on one of those rare two-mile-high bridges. The illustrator then gets in touch with his artsy side for a transition from one explosion to another, which would probably have worked better on the same page, but that's okay. The other explosion is a still from a sci-fi movie, and we meet Supergirl's ditched date, Steve, who is working at a fast food restaurant, but apparently not a very successful one, because he and his co-workers have time to talk about movies while looking at what Steve calls a scrapbook. Eventually, his boss tells him that his fries are roasting, which is a very unique way to cook fries, since most of them are usually fried, and tells him that his girlfriend is on the phone for him. We can see Supergirl has used a police officer's car phone to call Steve. Supergirl just casually blows her secret identity by saying that it's Linda Danvers calling while the police officer is standing right beside her. But hey, it's not like any of the four writers could have caught that one. With Supergirl slash Linda unavailable, Steve is still determined to go to the movies no matter what, so he takes his little sister Ellen. She starts harassing her brother for not putting on his seatbelt. Steve was ready for this, though, with three excuses. First, the seatbelt warning will turn off in a sec, so just ignore it. And his final argument is that they're not driving that fast. But the best is that he drives much better without it on. I'm not sure the math on this one checks out, but now that I'm thinking about it, I wonder if anybody on the esteemed website WikiHow has ever taught us how to disable a seatbelt alarm. Ah, WikiHow, a source of bad comics explaining how to do things. Let's see what they suggest for disabling a seatbelt alarm. Oh, apparently suggestion number three is to disable the alarm. That's how you disable it. Good advice. Let's get back to the comic. Of course, Steve and Ellen get in a car accident. This would be a very short story if everyone simply put on their seatbelts. It's no surprise to see Steve's head get smashed into the windshield, but his sister Ellen had her seatbelt on, and she still seems to get her melon driven into the steering column. I have no idea why this comic would make this unclear when its mission is to tell us seatbelts help keep us safe. This splash page is pretty great. It's a detailed shot of the aftermath of a car wreck. It isn't over the top, but it features convincingly twisted steel and glass and rubber ruined in a very scary way. This is all pushed a bit over the top with a bystander shouting out that nobody could survive an accident like that. The only way to improve this shot would be to have a second bystander add they could survive if they wore a seatbelt. The man who caused the car accident stumbles out of his car pretty much fine, and he laments, It's all my fault. I murdered them, and all because of a few drinks. But this issue isn't about the problems of too much drinking, so that guy just quickly gets escorted away, and he seems to have made it through the accident just fine. Was that gentleman wearing his seatbelt? Unclear. Did drinking make him invulnerable? Maybe. Anyway, now the story gets weird. In the hospital, a doctor tells Steve's family, including Ellen, who is fine, that physically there's no serious injury or brain trauma. So they can't explain it, but Steve is in a coma. Outside the room, Supergirl, as Linda Danvers, speculates that he is in a coma because he feels guilty about being in a car accident. Well, that's not how comas work. <laughs> I forgot to replace the milk in the fridge. Coma. I farted in an elevator. Coma. I only put out a Comic Tropes episode twice this past month. Coma. 
Supergirl visits Superman's intergalactic zoo at his Fortress of Solitude and thinks to herself that she's tired of being two people. Superman flies in to visit, uses his rarely seen superpower to turn black for a panel, and Supergirl announces she's going to quit being Supergirl. You might think I'm joking about Superman being able to turn black, but no. He really did have a machine that did just that. But for now, let's keep up with the seatbelt story. Supergirl tells her cousin that if she had simply been there with Steve, she could have saved him. Superman argues no matter what, they can't be everywhere at once. But fortunately, he does have just the machine to solve this particular problem. A device some aliens gave him that let you enter someone's mind. He says the danger is that if they die while you're in their mind, you die too. But Supergirl insists on using it. Still, I have to wonder why this machine requires Supergirl to be strapped down. How exactly would that help things? And honestly, if Supergirl was to thrash about, are there even any straps that could keep her down? So this just sort of asks us a lot of questions about Superman that we'd rather not ask. To cut the fat out of the story, we jump inside Steve's mind where he envisions himself in pastiches of famous movies. First up is a frozen version of Mad Max. He needs to drive across the snowy tundra to get fuel, and he goes up against some marauders. For inexplicable reasons, his sister Ellen tags along. She tells Steve to put on his seatbelt, but he refuses, arguing that if he crashed, the seatbelt could trap him. Supergirl pops up in the back seat, but he doesn't even seem to notice her. Sure enough, the Marauders attack Steve's sci-fi car. Eventually, the vehicle is pushed through a hole in the ice into the water. Steve bashes his head and is knocked unconscious, but Supergirl saves him. So this story is confusing because Supergirl will constantly be trying to talk to Steve and he either can't hear her or he ignores her, and yet, she's still able to intervene and save his life. It doesn't make any sense. The next coma-induced dream features Steve as an Indiana Jones knockoff. Again, his sister asks him to put on a seatbelt, but this time his counter-argument is that it's safer to be thrown free of the vehicle. Clearly, if you were being thrown through a window, you'd be moving so fast that when you hit a tree or the ground, you'd turn into soup. But these were real arguments that people made against seatbelts at the time. That really happened. I remember it. These days, I sell cars. And I'll tell you, I've never had a customer not put on their seatbelt. That just doesn't happen anymore. But it took generations of legislation and education and facts and figures being shared with the public to make it a common thing to do to keep themselves and others safe. While driving, some bandits ambush Steve and apparently throw a tiger at him. This bizarre move is only countered with an even stranger one. Steve somehow throws a snake at the tiger. This was the stupidest way of a hero using a snake against a threat until 1993's Hard Target, which featured Jean-Claude Van Damme punching out a rattlesnake, biting off its rattle to make it quiet, and leaving it as a trap for evil hunters. Once again, someone crashes into Steve's car, this time sending him flying at some rocks, but Supergirl saves him. Finally, we enter Steve's dream where he's a private eye in a noir-esque film. I wish that they'd colored this one in black and white. Steve gets in his car, and it's getting stranger each time for him to be bringing his little kid sister along with him, but this time, when Ellen asks him to put on his seatbelt, he finally does. He is once again hit, but this time, the seatbelts apparently keep everyone safe. However, if we jump back to the scene where Steve agrees to put on his seatbelt, it's quite clear that Supergirl does not have one on, which, hey, she's Supergirl, but it still doesn't fit well with the lesson. Steve wakes up from his coma, Supergirl is there as Linda to ask him out to the movies, and everything wraps up neatly. Mission accomplished. But wait! There was more. The book opens with a message from Elizabeth Dole, then secretary of the Department of Transportation, giving a few high-level facts and using the least flattering photo that DC could obtain. After the book ends, there are quizzes. Let's see what we learned. 
The first one gives you a mathematical formula for how much weight your body is if it's moving at just 35 miles per hour and is stopped suddenly. It's basically your body weight times 60, which means the average person needs to have the strength to brace against at least 10,000 pounds of force. Obviously, that's no problem for me, but all of you should wear a seatbelt to prevent needing to fight that much force. And now, the best stuff. This book gives us four what-if scenarios, and we have to give the best answer for each scenario based on what we've learned. So, let's take this together. I've got the questions right here. First up, there are five seatbelts in the car, and all of them are being used. Some more kids want to pile in to get to a football game. Do you, A let them ride with you, just this once, B, flatly refuse to let them into your car, or obviously, C, have them get on their skateboards and hold on tight to the back of the vehicle. That's the key, holding on tight. Second, your father feels he's a terrific driver and doesn't need a seatbelt. Do you, A, figure it's his decision and leave it at that, B, risk an argument by trying to convince him. Obviously, the answer is C, Ask him how he has returned from the dead planet of Krypton and inquire why he wants to drive a car anyway. Number three, at a party, you've noticed that the college friend who's supposed to drive you home has had a few drinks. He doesn't seem drunk though. Do you A, take the ride since he seems to be in control. B, politely decline and take a ride with someone else. Or here's the correct answer, C, give your friend a few more drinks so that you're positive that they're drunk, then take an Uber and charge it to your friend's account. All right, finally, your neighbor has asked you to do her a favor while you're babysitting her child. You have to be at the doctor at 5 p.m. What's more, you don't have an infant seat in your car. And the neighbor took her seat with her. The trip to her sister's house is a 20 minute drive on the highway. So do you, A, take the baby with you anyway, B, Stay with the baby and miss your appointment until the neighbor returns. No, it is C. You put the baby in the car, but don't drive it. Instead, lifting the car and carefully walking it over to your friend's house. Folks, I love public safety announcement comics. I think they're always entertaining. That said, there have been better ones. I've got a few final thoughts on this particular one. There's, they're, they're, they actually made a sequel to this. So I'll talk about that. Let's just take a quick look at some of the fan art that came in this week. Simon Tedder drew me with his character Freeman of the Landshark. You can see more by Simon on Instagram. Trevor Jessam is a tattoo artist from Toronto that illustrated me reviewing some X-Men comics. Christina Akana sent in this dark and moody art which is very cool. Brian Long shares his artwork where I'm coming at you Jack Kirby style. Grant Lankard made this piece where I'm meeting Jack Kirby. You can see more by Grant on his site. Max Castro envisions me in an updated Batman suit. You can find more by Max on Instagram. Prince Tolstoy drew me finding Infotron in one of my gachapons. He has a YouTube channel under that same name. Finally, Diogo Ebro illustrated me in some Liefeld-esque armor. You can see more by Diogo on Instagram. Thank you as always for watching. Uh, it really helps when you hit like and especially when you hit share. The more you share these videos, the more YouTube decides it's worth recommending to new viewers. So that always helps. Uh, if you would like to have artwork shown on this channel, I'm always happy to do that as long as it has something specifically to do with myself or comic tropes. Uh, anyway, just send any art that you're interested in to comictropes at gmail.com. I will share it and then I will pick a winner to get a gachapon prize. So we had eight entrants this week. Let's spin the ball hopper and see who won. Still got quite a few gachapon in here. I think I probably will phase out. Uh, giving out prizes at some point in the future, but for now it's very fun. So number six, that was this artwork. So very cool. Congratulations. I'm dropping all the gachapon balls on the floor. So I've just made a huge mess. Awesome. Something to clean up after. <laughs> Let's see what you want. Um, so like I said, I have a few more thoughts on Supergirl because they actually made a second comic in this. And in that one, Supergirl drives some kids in a car 
through a world full of fantasy creatures from famous myths. And somehow that one made a lot more sense than the one that we just reviewed. So I had to share that. But you know, there are good PSA comics out there. Um, I think that DC definitely spent a lot of time and gave some of its best talent on some of the new Teen Titans fighting drugs issues. Uh, by the way, the Gachapon here, uh, hmm, I never can figure out what this is, but it's something that glows and it's something monstery. And I think it's something cute. Oh, hold on. You know what? It's a it's a farting skunk and the fart cloud glows. So weird prize. I will send that your way. I love the weird gachapon. Those are some of my favorites. Um, I hope you guys had fun with this. I've got some uh, interviews and some deep dives on some great artists that I really, really love coming up. Um, let's see. Who do I have? I'm just looking behind me. Oh, yeah. I'm going to be doing some stuff on uh, uh, Darwin Cook pretty soon. He's one of my favorites. I've got some foreign comics that I'm still in the process of getting translated. Some foreign comics that, you know, aren't commonly available here in America, certainly haven't been issued as uh, English translations. So I've got some unique uh, stuff coming up. I'm, I'm pretty excited to share that. Um, I think I also want to do something on like some more modern people. Like uh, I'm really into... Uh, Daniel Warren Johnson these days. I think he's one of the most exciting creators out there. He's done Extremity, Murder Falcon. Um, he just did Wonder Woman, Dead Earth. Just a really, really exciting creator. There's, there's always good new comics to discover. So there's a bunch of stuff I want to talk about anyway. So if you would definitely consider hitting like and subscribe, just know that that helps the channel a lot. And also know that uh, if you want to support it any further, I always have a Patreon uh, where I give all sorts of exclusives. You can, you know, um, uh, see ep episodes early. You can vote on episodes. Uh, I have a behind the scenes blog. Um, I share artwork that I've done, things like that. Once you spend a certain amount, um, I send my backers an exclusive enamel pin, Comic Tropes enamel pin. So those are just some of the things you can get. Thank you for listening to my rambling. I'll see you soon. Until then, keep reading comics.